Okay, we are in, <coughs> excusez-moi s'il vous plaît, we are in Colossians chapter 2, and uh, we have worked our way down to verse 7, and um, greetings to everyone on Skype. I'm looking for where the camera normally is, and I'm not seeing, <laughs> oh, there it is. <laughs> It's a lot of you there, but I don't see you. <clears throat> um, verse 7. Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. So let's, let's look at this rooted and built up in him, first of all. I mean, there are two things, rooted and also built up. And we kind of barely touched on this at the end of the last time that I shared. And uh, that was um, that to be rooted in him is a living union. It is based on life. It's based on a life flow. Um, you know, we talk about life a lot, and we talk about life in Jesus, and we talk about us being in Christ uh, or that Christ being in us. But, you know, if all of that is stagnant, if there's not a flow of life, I mean, it's just like in your body, you, you, you don't just have life automatically. The life is in the blood and it flows throughout. And there's a, um, an establishment of that by the flow <coughs> and by the reality that it is, <coughs> excuse me, that it is, that flow is actually part of the life. I mean, it's, it flows because it has life in it. You do know that if a person's dead, their blood doesn't flow. Right? I'm just, you know, making that clear. <clears throat> and if you're alive, you're alive by Christ. You're not just alive because he made you alive. You're alive by him. Um, and so to be rooted... <clears throat> relates to a life union and another life that is flowing within you. And the words built up, um, I saw them sort of, sort of in two ways being built upon something and then within something. <clears throat> and these, the next bunch of scriptures will uh, absolutely um, qualify what I'm saying about being built within something, being built within him, and finding that as a, again, a life reality. Uh, it is so common for people to hear certain things like this and just make a doctrine out of them and then just glory in the fact that they know all this deep stuff and yet what Paul is going to say here, but not after Christ, not Christ. It's not him. It's not him. It's, it's us. It's still us. It's us. <clears throat> uh, how does it say that in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 1? Mishandling the word of God, you know. And we think, well, that means perverting it to such a degree that, you know, it's, uh, it's heresy or something. No, it's, it's, it can literally be having very deep truths and, and being able to explain them and to, you know, chart them and all of this kind of stuff and not have the flow of his life through us. And so <clears throat> that's, Paul is what he's trying to do again. He's trying to, or, or still, um, he is reacting to the Gnostics who, um, and, and most, most people today would say, I'm not a Gnostic, you know. Um, but the Gnostics were just people who uh, prided themselves in the depths that they have. And if, you know, if we're doing that, but it's not the living Christ, it's not the one who is um, uh, producing the fruit of his nature, then it's just us. And it's us, you know, and, and we feel good about it because we're standing for, I'm standing for Jesus. 
okay, yeah, it's like Jesus is over there and you're over there standing for him. Well, you're supposed to be in him, <laughs> you know. It's not just making a stand for Jesus. The best way to make a stand for Jesus is, you, I like the way that this is worded here. It says, establishing the faith as you have been taught. And even when I was in my office just before I walked out, I thought, you know, and I don't know that I've ever thought this before, but I thought how important was it to the body of Christ back then <clears throat> that those who were apostles, and when we say apostles, we're not just talking about the 12. We're talking about those who were sent of God to establish the church in, in him, not in the truth, but in him. And... And uh, Paul is saying, you know, even as you have been taught. In other words, <clears throat> a, a standard, a, 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 a clarity of seeing him is where your teaching is coming from. A clarity, a clarity of seeing him. <clears throat> Um, there is a difference between seeing him in the scriptures and understanding the one that was and is and is to come. Seeing him as he is, not just seeing the scriptures that declare him. And I used this example before, but <clears throat> I mean, I can never grow tired of it, and that is the tabernacle, and that is that every ounce of everything in that tabernacle was of God, but not one part of it literally was God until you went into the Holy of Holies. And so that's, you know, and then Jesus, you know, starts talking about it. And then in, in uh, Hebrews, it talks about it. That's where we need to go. We need to come boldly in there. <clears throat> but, you know, uh, and we read to find help in time of need. And all we can think about is our earth needs instead of, I need, here's my need, Jesus. I need to know you in here, not out there. You know what I'm saying? A real heart to say, thank you for all of the, the types and the shadows and the things. And, and, and uh, <clears throat> I remember when I was in Bible school, and I didn't understand it, but I remember listening to uh, one of the teachers teaching uh, the tabernacle, <clears throat> and I, I still don't know if I can put it into words, but I had a very clear sense <clears throat> that someone could say, okay, well, here's the altar, and that's Jesus and the cross, without knowing anything of Christ crucified as a reality of your life. Um, um, and could look at the labor and say, well, that represents the word of God. And, and then, you know, and it's got the knobs that connect the, the, all the poles and everything. And just, well, that represents, and I'm going, you know, I want to know Jesus beyond the stuff that represents him. I'd like to know him, you know. <clears throat> and you've heard me teach the tabernacle, and yes, I think there's much in that. But I would hope, even then when I taught it, I would hope that I'm trying to make that our story, not the story of the people in the book of Exodus, that, that this reality has to be our story, or we're just reading about it and going, well, this is, this is what they knew, and, <clears throat> and really even assuming that they knew the Lord, but... Moses is the one who got the pattern from God's face and from God, right? He brought it down and explained it to them, but they didn't see him. And they never went in the Holy of Holies, but they did build it and God was on them to build it. And Bezalel particularly, who to me does represent the Holy Spirit because he was the one who, who took the, the, the uh, instructions like a blueprint which in a certain sense you could say was like a piece of paper with the, the way it was supposed to all be. And Bezalel took it all and made it real so that they could walk among it and everything. <clears throat> so I think that he is a true picture of the Holy Spirit. But still, what he's making is the shadow. 
and you don't know and I don't know what he is until we enter into enter in behind the veil. And and the word unveiled is the word revelation. It's the same word, and we talk about coming to a revelation of Christ. We're not talking about the scriptures being unveiled pertaining to Jesus. And yes, yes, I mean, I search the scriptures and I see them all the time. But I hope that the, the Holy Spirit, I hope Bezalel is taking it from there and building the real inside of me. You know, that's what I want. <clears throat> and to boast in uh, my teaching or my depth or anything just makes me a Gnostic. It does. It, it does not make me a true son of God by Christ. It does not make Christ formed in me in such a manner that I'm rooted in him and therefore what he is will flow through my, me as a branch. You know, you know I, I just resist that concept. And that, and you know what? You don't even have to have a real super duper heart after Jesus to gain that. You know, you can, you can find everybody's book that's ever written on the subject and read it and go, I got it, you know. But to really know the Lord, he doesn't just come up and slap you in the face and da-da-da-da. I mean, there has, there's, a, there's a heart. It has to be a heart that when the heart turns to the Lord. And, of course, you know, you know, my explanation of that, we th always think that, well, my heart just turned. I know it did. And he's going, well, actually, no, you're just feeling kind of bad right now, so you cry it out, and it'll pass. This too shall pass. <laughs> In other words, to come to that place where I, you, you know, I'm not rooted, and I will not be satisfied until I'm rooted in you and I, I know that the the flow of life resides in here and not just like a flow coming to my mind and everything in the scriptures <clears throat> so uh, and then built up um, well I shared this when I was in doctor uh, in doctor when, in Georgia when I was um, presenting this thing uh, where we are we are as Christians trying to be built up in uh, Christianity trying to be built up in doctrines and ministries how do I pray for somebody how would I ever do communion if I was asked to do it how would I um, you know um, visit the the sick or whatever and we go through all of this stuff and we and we're we're seeking to be built up in christianity in the christian religion this says plainly rooted and built up in him and he is super um emphasizing that and will do so in the next bunch of scriptures several times where he says in him in him in him um, because th apparently the Gnostics are part of the Christian movement thing maybe they've joined maybe they're but they're they're influencing the Christians away from Christ as the one that we know and are rooted in and it's the reality of his life into these great depths and <clears throat> Paul is refuting refuting that back and forth because not because he um, was one of those people that said I will stand against everything that's bad or I will stand against everything that's not right or that's not doctrinally sound how about that I'll stand against everything that's not doctor he's not standing against what's not doctrinally sound He's standing against being moved from Christ. That's a huge thing to him. Because to him, that's it. I mean, you know, on the road to Damascus, he got knocked off his donkey. And he, you know, he didn't have an encounter in a Christian church. He didn't, 
you know, he didn't read a New Testament Bible. He didn't even bump into a Christian who started explaining what they do. Bam! His first encounter was Jesus, and then he went out in the wilderness and, and later into Damascus where he ran into Jesus, probably thinking, I'm going to come back here because that's where I, you know. <clears throat> um, and, and explains that in Galatians that, you know, I didn't get this. I didn't go to Jerusalem. Well, that'd be the first thing I'd probably do. These guys walked with him for three and a half years. I would go, what was he like? You know, most of us would go, what color was his eyes? You know, what was he like? Was he, you know, how did he look? Tell me about some of your experiences. Their experiences mean nothing. That's their story. You know, I don't mean they don't mean anything. I mean a lot to them, but I'm just saying to us, if we start, you know, I, and, and I, I'll get in trouble for this, but I'll go ahead and say it. I know people that all they do is read biographies of famous people or Christians or whatever. And, and I think there's, a, there's some value into that, but primarily you're reading someone else's story. And you're not going to get your story fully written by just reading someone else's. And can I go ahead and say this? And, and, uh, and I'll, I will say now, uh, if you're one of those people, um, keep doing it. Don't change because I'm telling you. But to me, um, you're filling yourself with stuff that happened to other people that may never happen to you that way. Because God will deal with you according to you. And then you'll start praying according to those things. And then you'll start, you know, and then you'll go, well, you did this with that person. And you did this one with that person. I remember early on I read um, the uh, autobiography of Charles Finney. <laughs> and he, he would, he would uh, they invited him to come share with a, a bunch of, iron workers or something like that and so all these guys are dirty and messed up and they're they're hardcore guys and <clears throat> and he just walks in the building and they all go oh and start crying out i want you know i want jesus and he just walks over and prays for all of them and and that happened over and over with him and so you know i remember praying that and god never has done that yet with me uh, in fact, I walk in and they, people go, who the heck is that? You know, <laughs> anyway, but it's not, you know, uh, I, I know that our God is beyond even my words and saying all of this. But maybe a little bit like Paul, I fear lest we be spoiled through philosophy and vain deceit and the traditions of men and not after Christ. And that is a, a concern with me. That is a real concern. So when I hear, you know, something that, I mean, I mean, I, to me, there's a straight line to Jesus. The Holy Spirit will take you straight there, you know. I mean, he will take you straight. He doesn't go, well, let's talk about, you know, and walk with me. <laughs> He's not going to do that. <laughs> you know, he, you know, I want to tell you about me a little bit. He doesn't talk about himself. He came to declare Christ. He's beautiful. Yes. And so, uh, and w yet we can, you know, we can put him in our box. We can put him in our ark and keep him in there until one day we say, if we're ever going to know the new creation, we need to let the dove go. Yes. Remember in, yes. in Noah's situation? And so, you know, I don't think Noah ever saw that happen with anybody else. I think in his story, he realized we could be in here forever. Somebody will find this boat, and it'll be full of all kind of bones, and they'll go, what sort of voodoo is going on here or something, you know? Um, and so he said, "We, you know, we got to find out. He went up. To the highest spot in there, open the little window and let the dove go and, and 
trusted that the Holy Spirit, is, when he comes back, he's going to eventually bring evidence of a new creation, not the old one that he, he left. And the first time the dove didn't come back with anything. And it says that Noah pulled him in unto himself. I love that. I love that we can, we can do that to the Holy Spirit and we can say, you know, it's okay. You know, I, you, you know the right timing there and you know the right timing here inside of me. You know the circumstances out there better than I do. You can fly. I can't. You can see more. I can't. So I pull you in unto me and say, thank you for coming back because <laughs> this ark would be hell without you. And then wait for the right time again and release him and then he comes back with a twig of life after massive destruction, a new creation. And so, <clears throat> um, and I, you know, I trust the Holy Spirit to do that to us and for us. So, you know, that's enough of sounding like I'm on a soapbox when I'm not. I think it's the same spirit that Paul's trying to do here and keep it, keeping them, uh, you know, heading toward Christ. Um, so uh, verse 8 says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. So the last verse said, okay, rooted and built up in him. And this is saying, you're, you know, those people do that not after Christ. And verse 9 says, for in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And verse 10 says, you are complete in him. So do you get the picture? It is single-minded Jesus you're it. I don't have another plan. I don't have another uh, place I want to go, not in my mind, not in my heart. I want to I wanna bring everything in captivity to the reality, the true knowledge, the reality of you. And... And, and when you do that, then the Spirit of God comes alongside as the comforter to, to make it, make it happen, make it real, make it real. <clears throat> um, beware, lest any man spoil you. You know, I was looking at that word and I thought, you know, it's kind of like, you were once good fruit, but we left you out too long. <laughs> you know, like bananas, you can do that too. And some of you are bananas. <laughs> and some of you are other kinds of fruit. But that you, you set it out, and you, if you leave it too long, it spoils. We don't need to be just sitting around. You know, we need to become ripe. And then, well, there's an interesting little bug. I know, buddy. What? There was no pain except for him. <laughs> um, uh, I'm just glad I didn't get too close. He had a clock crawled right on my little mustache. Um, I mean, just using that analogy, we can sit too long. We can, um, I know <laughs> when I was on this trip, Flew to Georgia, and then Dennis picked me up. My brother picked me up from the airport and drove to his house, which took about three to three and a half hours sitting in the car. We got there. We sat the whole time I was there. Um, and then, um, and so then I also, then I went to Florida, and you sit on the plane, and then you get there. Oh, yeah, I was on a train, and you sit there the whole time. And anyway almost no chance to to walk you know and uh, my body is going I'm tired of sitting I need to move can we get to a place where spiritually we say that I am tired of sitting I want life I want to move with the Lord 
and, and continually cry out in that direction. And then uh, not distracted, not distracted. There are a lot of things that can distract us. This says philosophy, traditions, rituals, Christian facts, things that are not after Christ. All right, so <clears throat> someone says, well, I can't even read a, a book, a novel. Well, I can't, <laughs> but not because spiritually I, I'd be offending anybody. I think that there is freedom once Christ begins to be formed in you and you're not drawn away. You're not drawn away. You're not drawn away. <clears throat> I think before that time, you're wasting your time. And that, again, that's my opinion. Okay. So, Randy, you're too strict. I'm really not very strict at all, actually. <laughs> I'm not. As a person, I'm not. As a leader, I'm not. <laughs> but I'm telling you, in my case, <clears throat> um, I think that, that there must be a concerted time where you don't have all these distractions. And, you know, that was why I raised up this Bible school. Did you all know that? That's why I raised it up. Three, the disciples walked with Jesus for three and a half years. Paul started a, a Bible school in Ephesus, three years. And I said, Lord, what's the deal with three years? And he said, it takes time to really get this in you. Well, some of you have been here for a long time. Have we ever had someone go three years here and really never get the Lord at all? Yes. <laughs> you know. Um, to me, that's the time. It's like, I don't care about anything else. I'm setting this time aside. I'm setting my life aside for the Lord now. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna get the Lord. I'm gonna, I'm gonna seek Him, and and according to His grace and His timing, um, He will reveal His Son. The Father will reveal His Son in me. To me, at the end of, and we have some here that have done this. At the end of three years, they can still come to the classes. Still, you go. Well, you don't have to anymore but there's still a hunger. There's still a hunger. There's still a desire for Jesus. There's still a heart that's going after him. N you know, not every, you know, these are hard areas for me to talk about because they can be seen as legalism or law or whatever. All I know is God told me when I was in Bible school that I would raise up a Bible school. And he told me that it needed to be a three-year school because that's his pattern. And he, um, um, and he said that as much as the ones who come can do, let them give themselves for those three years to nothing but that. And, uh, you know, as I said, we had, we've had some come and they barely gave themselves really to pursue in the Lord. You know, Kelly's one of them. She's, and she's going to be teaching y'all next, so y'all you know, be careful. Beware, lest any man spoil. <laughs> so, enough of that. Except for, but not after Christ. Spoil you through this and this and this, but not after Christ. But not after Christ. Doggone it, people. But not after Christ? That means you're not after Christ. <laughs> For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Um, there, is a, there is a way to teach in Christ or in him that is uh, 
has nothing to do with union. It has everything to do with some sort of a spiritual, it has everything to do with a big circle. And you, you're taken out of a square and into a circle. <laughs> and in truth, there, in this reality, there are no squares and circles. <laughs> There's only what you were in Adam or what you were because you can forget that. I mean, it, it is true that it's the nature of Adam and the way of Adam, but it's you, your version. <laughs> and then it's Christ. And there are people who see this thing of in Christ and it becomes a great doctrine of which they can really tell you stuff, but, the, um, but there's no union. And in union is what it really means, in union with Christ. And it means that, for example, verse 9 here, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Uh, and then verse 10, and you are complete in him. Two in hymns in a very short, you know, part there. Um, I believe that to truly grasp what this is saying is to understand that there is nothing of Christianity that you are meant to have that does not come and is not resident in him. And you are joined to him so that it may be by life. Righteousness isn't the subject to Jesus. He never studied it. You know, he is that. He is made unto you righteousness. Redemption, wisdom, all those things. <clears throat> he is the I am of all these things. I am your peace. You know, he says all this stuff. So we go to him and ask for peace. And, um, and to me, when I hear that, it, I am convinced that they do not understand. It has not really hit them that I cannot get this in me at all except I be joined with him. And what comes is in him, resident in his life, in his nature, in his way. And when, you know, if, if, if I, for some weird reason, wanted, you know, six phalanges, you know, and I had one uh, grafted in and my life went into that, every ounce of what it had of life and of reality would come through the rest of what I am. Well, we have been grafted into Jesus. We have been grafted into him. And as such, um, we must, or we're going to miss all this. We're, we will be spoiled with, uh, and distracted with philosophy and traditions and Christian facts and all this kind of stuff. We will. But if we become established in this, what we will always know is nothing comes by me. I am not it. I may be a vessel. It may come through me. <laughs> Remember you got rebuked for <laughs> saying through me once. To <laughs> but it may come through me as a, as, a, as a branch, as an arm, as a body. I mean... The life of the body, that hand would not move unless the body had life and the life they have is my life. Well, that's just a vague picture of our reality. And our reality has got to be Christ. And we, we'll all say it is. But, but we, do we regularly um, think in terms of, well, I got to get this instead of, I have this by union already. I need to have this working in me. Because if you're striving for something you already have, that's like the woman who lost the coin. And she's looking around for the coin, and maybe the coin rolled over there, and she's looking over here like, I got to get this, I got to get this. When the reality of it, we have it. We are 
complete in him. Verse 10 begins with that, the very next verse. Complete in him. And, he, and may I say it like this? We are complete in him, and he is the completion of all things that we would want. Okay, so even with everything I just said, with everything I just said, we can stuff that into a, a doctrinal tube of in Christ and use uh, even the exact words that I've said and still go along with this other. But there is a difference, and the difference is Jesus, you as a person, you as the only reality of my life is everything to me. And I am not, and here it comes, I'm not seeking these things, righteousness, uh, peace, all this. I'm seeking the reality of those things as you in me. Okay? Now, do we ever around here pray, oh, Lord, just give them peace? Instead of, oh, Lord, may Christ be in a real way. Well, why would we pray like that or whatever? We would pray that way because we still don't grasp that we have been distracted, we have been spoiled, we have been drawn away by things that probably we were taught before. Didn't, didn't I say something about it's better not to get into all that stuff in the first place? Some of us couldn't help it. I mean, I know I was there but the Spirit of God is able to, to take our little jar of what we call peace and say, Randy, we're just going to set this over here on this table, and uh, now I'd like to introduce you to peace. It's Jesus. And you go, okay, he is my peace. And so then you say, I don't get it. I can understand if you gave it to me and I felt peace. I can understand that. But you just said, he's my peace. How is that really peace in me? Is that a good question? It is a good question. We, we, we should, but we go, oh, well, I want to be spiritual and go, he's my peace. And just say that the rest of my life and never really comprehend that, you know. And here's the problem, see, Jesus said, I, you know, peace I give unto you, and he is our peace. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. So it's not going to be the same. You're not going to feel all warm and fuzzy. I'm so peaceful. You know, thank you that you made me peaceful. Well, all he's got to do is send one little crisis and you'll be out of that. You know what I mean? Right? You can feel so peaceful. And, then the, and if the Lord wanted it to show you, he'd go, I'm so happy you're peaceful. Do you feel good? Yeah, I feel great. Man, thank you, Lord. It's just my surroundings, everything is so serene. He says, well, I want to, I want to teach you something. Go ahead, Lord. Just, I'm just so peaceful. I just want to be with you. And he sends a horrible Christ, and you go, ah, oh, no, what am I going to do? And how am I going to handle this? And what's going to happen? And all this stuff. And then we would look at that, and we said, well, that's the devil, not the Lord. And it's the, it's the Father, and it's the Spirit of God trying to teach you Christ but you're holding on to a distraction to maintain your good feelings of peace instead of him being your peace so how do, how do you how would i explain jesus being your peace i won't i will tell you he is meant to be your peace as well as everything else and uh and if I told you, then you would seek him for peace, which is the same thing, instead of seeking him. Anybody see a difference in that? You know? And then you get all caught up in, you know, coming back to Jesus again. He's going, I thought we got through this. <laughs> you know? I thought we got this settled. Well, Lord, it's only, I've only heard this, you know, probably 2,000 times. Tell me another 2,000 times, and maybe I'll get it. No. I mean, if it's been more than 50 times 
it's time to stop the machine and say, Lord, I clearly don't understand this because I automatically go back here. I automatically am a charismatic. I'm not a son of God by Christ. I'm not in union with him. I'm like a charismatic believer. I automatically go there. So I'm sick of that. I want you. And I want you as the reality so that when I speak, people will go, oh, that's different. I, he, he made that Jesus. <laughs> or she made that Jesus. You know what I mean? We are, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So what, where are we going to look for other stuff? You're going to have to look outside of him. But your reality has to be him. Father, I need to go search out the fullness of the promised land. That's Jesus. Amen? Yes. What if God, in bringing Israel out of bondage, in his mind, the whole time he's thinking of the promised land is Christ, and I want to bring you to a land of chocolate milk and honey. And he's thinking of his son and the reality and that one day this shadow will, will, will help you to realize, oh, my God, the Father. He, and he's, and you, you can read it. And in there is... All of the, you won't have to build houses and da 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 da, and there's fruit trees and there's all this stuff. And we go, we're going to get all that stuff. That's the way we think. I'm going to get the stuff that's in that land and that the stuff from Jesus, though. See, we can understand in the land there's all that stuff, and we go, well, you got to go in there to get it. But we can't understand. All this stuff is in him, and the only place I can get it is in him, in union with him, and it being him. Yes. And that's your greatest joy. I mean, what if that's your greatest joy? It's Christ. I don't want anything else. I want you as my peace. I want you as my joy. I want you... You know, all of these, you just start going through all of these things and, and you say, I'm going to appropriate the land. I'm going to possess the land. Everywhere I put my heart, it'll be mine. You know. So I really believe that this is the spirit in which Paul is presenting this stuff because he's, he's clearly, I mean, you remember he, he's having great conflict. Y'all remember that in the earlier verses? He's having great conflict that, um, uh, that they are getting off from Christ onto all these other things and they're not necessarily bad things. They're not Christ, and so he says, that would be, you know, to him, I'm sure he would look at it and go, that would be like God bringing you into the land, and anytime you needed anything, you stepped outside the land and hunted for it out there. Moab and Ammon and all those places, because they were things to you, and that's the only place you could find things, because in him, they're not things, they're him. Amen? So I, I, with all my heart, I mean, I have gone over and over these scriptures, and I, I um, you know, I feel, I felt that transition from chapter 1 to chapter 2 when he was talking about um, uh, Christ in you is the hope of God and of you, and and then, you know, he started saying, this is, this, is the, this is what we preach. This is this very thing. And then he goes, while I'm preaching and talking to you, this is what's working in me to do that. I mean, that's pretty cool. That's pretty swallowed up. And then 
next chapter, which is not a next chapter because it was just a letter, the next thing he says, but I have great conflict over you that you are being drawn away and that, you know, that these other things are becoming more important and that you're and that not after Christ. And, you know, don't you know that in him all this resides and it's, it's him. It is literally finding him. I mean, if you could ever say, I'm knowing the Lord, this is one way that you do it. I am knowing you. And I'm also um, possessing what God promised me that I could have. You in all your fullness. All the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And I'm complete in him. So just a few more minutes here and just say, so we, we, we grab that doctrine and we say, okay, I'm complete in him and the word can't change and, you know, um, uh, uh, and therefore I don't need to strive for anything and I don't know, I've, I'm complete. Okay, just look around the room. How many complete people do you see? <laughs> I mean, just, just be real. You're not complete in you, trust me. Because I've been with most of you. You're not complete in you. You're complete in him. And the completion of you is when you're completely in him. <laughs> completely in you and completely uh, understanding that, that if any, you know, like Paul said, if any good thing comes out of me, it's the Lord. You know, no good thing can come out of me that's me. All right. You say, you mean, gosh, Paul must have been a real reprobate. Nothing, you know, could come. He's just saying anything that's not Christ, he doesn't want. That, it, yeah, to him, it could be considered the worst of the worst, even though it's not. He was a Pharisee. He, was, he wasn't out, you know, robbing banks, murdering people, or, <clears throat> you know, doing all this kind of stuff. But he said, I am less than the least of all saints because I was going against this very reality that is him. And I was saying, that ain't right. And we should, it should be about us being right with God instead of him. And when he saw it, he went, I am less than the least of all saints who persecuted him, persecuted them. Because he, he, saw, he saw them as him. Because in him, we're complete in him. In him is the fullness of the... So he couldn't say, you know, he couldn't say with all good conscience, you know, what I'm doing, I'm just doing to them. He understood he's going against the very thing Thing that God has made, the provision of provisions, the height and the length and the breadth and the depth, all fullness that is, that is him. And it, it bothered him the rest of his life. I mean, he spent the rest of his life bringing forth Christ like no one else, like no one else, but always a, a a wound that, ah, you know, I, I am just the least. And yet that was probably like similar to the thorn of the, in the flesh, you know, that it was just a good reminder. I'm not it. He's it. You know, a good reminder. And we can hear that, but it won't mean anything to you until you experience such a horrible thing and then you'll go, oh, yeah, that's what Randy meant, you know, 20 years ago when he was alive. <laughs> hey, Amen. Well, there is just so much to say, isn't there? Thanksgiving just came up. 
abounding with thanksgiving. <clears throat> I mean, whatever thanksgiving, you know, we, we give God thanks a lot, but it's, it's like, you know, again, back to the peace. Thank you. Thank you for the peace I'm feeling today. Not, Father, thank you for the promised land and the he that is the fullness of your heart and is becoming the fullness of my heart. You know, we're just, we just don't, we're not, we're not right. <laughs> you know, we're not right. We need to get right. So, Father, we ask you to just uh, bless your word and, you, and may we begin to grasp the heart of the matter, which is your son, May we quit looking to gain something, but, but to identify clearly that, that that something is your son, and I want more of him. I want an increase of him, not an increase of Christian attributes. We ask you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you got a little break, and then Kelly's going to come back and... <clears throat>